Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. Sundays are good days, aren't they? I mean, we get to come here, spend time with one another, worship our amazing God together in song, and learn a little bit more about Him. Uh, I really enjoy Sundays. I really enjoy being with all of you and seeing all of you as well. If you would, go ahead and open up your Bible. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, that's where we're going to begin the lesson, the lesson this morning. And while you're turning there, uh, let me just remind you of what you, we've done over the last couple of weeks. Over the last couple of weeks, Max and I, we preached on the image of God. Two weeks ago, I preached on the image of God, and I talked about what that meant. And, and we came to the conclusion that being created in God's image means that we should rule righteously for God. That is the, that is the primary goal of humanity. That's our primary goal, to rule righteously for God. So that's what it means to be created in, in God's image. And last week, Max talked about being created in, in the image of God as well. And he talked about how that fact should shape and, and mold our thinking. Because we're created in God's image, we should see one another and the rest of humankind differently from the rest of the world. We should treat one another with dignity and respect. That's essentially the point that Max is trying to make. And in, in my opinion, anyway, uh, both of those lessons were meant sort of as precursors to the lesson that we're going to work through this morning, the lesson that I'm going to preach this morning. I've been planning on preaching this sermon for a little while, and I said, well, if I'm going to preach this, I've got to sort of set the scene with the, the image of God stuff first. Matthew chapter 26. Please. Matthew 26. In the context, Jesus, he is on trial, and he's talking to the high priest, Caiaphas. And, you know, they're, they're trying to sentence him to death because they don't like what Jesus is doing and what he's standing for and how, and how everyone is following him. So they're trying to crucify Jesus. And Caiaphas asked Jesus in this context, he says, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus responds in a, in a very interesting way. And he responds in a way that we don't always understand. Let's look at verse 64. Uh, Caiaphas asks Jesus, are you the Christ? the Son of God, and Jesus responds by saying, well, you say so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So here Jesus says something, and like I said, he says something that we don't always understand. We kind of just read past it, and because of this, well, I want to talk about that language in the lesson this morning. In the lesson, I want to essentially answer two questions, and one of them is, why does Jesus say this to Caiaphas? Why does he say, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven? And we're going to answer that question here pretty early. And then eventually we'll talk about what that means for us and, and how to apply that to our lives. So what does Jesus mean? Why does Jesus say what he says here? Well, Jesus is quoting from Daniel chapter 7. And if we go back to Daniel 7, we see that Daniel, or in that chapter, uh, we see that there are four beasts. And what I think Jesus is saying here is he's saying that you, Caiaphas, as a leader of Israel, and ultimately Israel as a whole, what he's saying is, you guys are beasts. He's saying, Jerusalem, Israel, you, the high priest, the religious leadership, you're beasts, like the beasts that we see in Daniel chapter 7. And don't let that beast language confuse you. Uh, the beast language means something, and it means something very simple throughout Scripture. Uh, when Scripture calls something or someone a beast, what it means is, it means that they're against God. That's simply what it means. So if you're reading through the book of Daniel, and you see these nations that are described as beasts, what does that mean? Well, it means that those nations are against God. When you read through the book of Revelation, and you see that the Roman Empire is described as this beast, or really multiple beasts, but regardless, you see that they're described as these beasts, what does that mean? Well, it means that they are against God. And this language is, is similar to language that we use. You know, I was watching this, this crime drama, and I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was CSI, maybe it was NCIS. I don't really remember. But there was the serial killer, and someone in the show used a word to describe the serial killer. You know what it was? It was monster, right? So we use that language. They called this person a monster because they were wicked and evil. Well, when the Bible talks about people who are against God's will, who, who are against God, well, the Bible calls them beasts. So that's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is calling Caiaphas, he's calling Jerusalem a beast. In Daniel 7, 
makes that clear for us. As a matter of fact, you can put a bookmark at Daniel 7 because we'll, we're going to come back to it. But the main theme of Daniel chapter 7 really is conflict. And it's conflict between man and beast. Now, we've already talked about the beast. The beast are those who are against God. But what is man? If you look at the Bible, man are those who are supposed to be with God. So there's this conflict between people who are supposed to be with God, man, and people who are against God, the beast. And we see this throughout all of Scripture, by the way. And we see it at the very beginning. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, this is the context with the fall of man. And we've already been introduced to Adam and Eve on pages, on pages 1 and 2 of the Bible. But here we get to page 3, Genesis chapter 3, and we're introduced to a new character. And that character is, is Satan through the imagery of this serpent. And the serpent is described as what in Genesis chapter 3? Well, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any what? Than any beast of the field. So you see this conflict very early on in Scripture, this conflict between man and beast. Adam and Eve, they're obviously the, the humans in the story. And what were they supposed to do? Well, they were supposed to rule righteously for God. They were supposed to be with God. And the serpent, was the serpent with God or against God? The serpent was against God. So you, there's this conflict between man and beast. Is Adam and Eve going to rule righteously, or is the beast going to rule over them? And we know what happens. The beast ends up ruling over them. And we see a similar concept in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, turn over there. We'll start reading from verse 1. It says, now Adam and Eve knew, or now Adam knew Eve, his wife, excuse me, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain was angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? Now verse 7 is the important verse, because God says something very interesting to Cain here. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. God says, If you do well... Will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over. So God tells Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Sin is waiting for you. Well, what's this language? Sin is crouching at the door. It sounds like what? It sounds like a beast, doesn't it? So in Genesis chapter 4, there's this, this conflict between man and beast. Cain is supposed to rule. As a matter of fact, that's what it says. You must rule over. Cain is supposed to rule righteously for God as a human. He's supposed to be on God's side. But there is sin. There is, there is sin as a beast that is a God. And like I say, we continue to see this. Turn over to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. We're just going to go through some text because I want to submit this concept in your mind. Daniel chapter 4. In this context, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and that's not surprising. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a couple of dreams as we go through the book of Daniel. And like the other dream that we see in Daniel chapter 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar needs this dream interpreted. So he, he goes to Daniel. And Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of this dream. Daniel tells him, look, here's what the dream means. The dream, it means if you don't repent, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar had a pride issue. So Daniel says, if you don't repent of your pride, then God is going to punish you. Well, let's look at how King Nebuchadnezzar responds. Let's pick up Daniel 4, verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? So Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, you need to repent because of your pride. And Nebuchadnezzar responds 12 months later, Man, look at this great kingdom that I built with my power. King Nebuchadnezzar, he's not listening to God. King Nebuchadnezzar, he's standing against God. And notice what we see in the next verse, verse 31. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar, 
He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. So we see it's very interesting in this context, King Nebuchadnezzar stands against God. Humanity is supposed to be with God. But King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't do that. So God says, okay, if you want to be like a beast, then I'm going to drive you from men, and you'll be with the beast that you're acting. You see, the beasts are against God. And if we stand against God, it's like we're not human. It's like we have become a beast. And, and again, we see this throughout Scripture, and that's not surprising. It's not surprising that we see this conflict uh, between man and beast throughout Scripture because God said it was going to happen, right? Genesis chapter 3 again, Genesis 3 and verse 15, I will put enmity between you. He's talking about the serpent, talking about the beast. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So in the very beginning, God talked about this conflict between the offspring of the beast, of, of the serpent, and the offspring of the woman. And who's that offspring, by the way? The offspring of the serpent. Sometimes we think, well, it's Satan. I think that's true. I just don't think it's the whole truth. I think the offspring of the serpent are those who allow the serpent to rule over them, those who allow Satan to rule over them. We see this in Matthew chapter 23. Jesus, he's talking to the Pharisees and scribes about their wickedness, and he says, you serpents. And doesn't that sound familiar? Highlighting, it's going back to Genesis chapter 3. You serpents. You brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? So here, Jesus calls the religious leaders in Jerusalem serpents, and he calls them offspring of serpents. They're offsprings of serpent? Doesn't that sound familiar? I'll put enmity between your offspring and her offspring. So you see, this conflict between man and beast goes through all of Scripture. And that's exactly what we see in Daniel chapter 7. Go ahead and turn back there. Daniel chapter 7. In, in that chapter, we see beast, but we also see a man. And we see that there's this conflict between them. Daniel chapter 7, let's pick up in verse 1 and we'll be introduced to these beasts. Uh, it says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So uh, we've gone back in time. Uh, before we were in, in the Persian Empire, and now we're going back to Babylon. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another. So here, in, in, in these, these first three chapters, and I'm not going to put any more verses on the screen, so you're going to you're gonna have to turn to the rest. Uh, here, in these first three verses of Daniel, chapter 7, we're introduced to these four beasts. Well, who are these beasts? Let's jump down to verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. So the four beasts that we see in Daniel, were well, they're four kings or four nations. And the reason they're described as beasts, well, we already know the answer, because they're against God. So these are the beasts in Daniel, but who, who is the human? Who is the human in Daniel chapter 7? Let's look up in verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So the human in Daniel chapter 7 is this son of man. As a matter of fact, that's what son of man means. Son of man is like a Hebrew way of saying the human one. You know, we, don't, we look at that language and we're like, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a son of man? All it means is to be a human one. You know, we see something similar in the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon where, where there are women in that book described as the daughters of Jerusalem. What does that mean? It just means that they belong to Jerusalem. They're Jerusalemites. Oh. What something similar is going on here with the language of the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the one who belongs to humanity, the human one. And we know who that's referring to. That's referring to Jesus. Jesus is the, the human one. Why? Well, because he rules righteously for God. And he's the only one who did it perfectly. He's the only one who fulfilled humanity's 
true goal perfectly. And that's why sort of whenever you read some scholarly books and commentaries and stuff, they'll call Jesus the truly human one. Why is he truly human? Because he truly fulfills what it means to be human. So in Daniel chapter 7, we see this conflict between Jesus, the human one, the one who stands with God, and the beast, those who stand against God. So we get back to the question. Why does Jesus quote Daniel 7? There are two main characters in Daniel 7, the beast and the human. Why does Jesus quote Daniel 7? Let me give you an illustration. If we were all at this Star Wars convention, because we're all a bunch of nerds or whatever, and I dress up as Darth Vader, and I come up to you, come up to you, and I ask, or I don't ask, I say, I am your father. Well, in that scenario, who am I? Well, obviously, I'm Darth Vader. But who are you in that scenario? The nerds know. I don't even have to say the name. If I walk up to you in a Darth Vader costume, I come up to you and I say, I am your father, you're Luke. Now, I didn't have to make that explicit. You just, you know the scene, right? That's a very famous scene in Star Wars. People know about it. You know what's going on. Well, that's what's going on with Jesus here. Jesus, he's quoting from this famous scene that they would have known. You know, the ancient Jews, they knew their Bible, even though they might have misapplied it sometimes. They knew Daniel 7. Daniel 7 was famous. And and Caiaphas, he's this big Bible nerd, he knows Daniel 7. And when when Jesus comes and quotes Daniel 7 and says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, well, who's the Son of Man in that scenario? Jesus is. And they knew that. That's actually, Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man to describe himself the most out of any other phrase. He doesn't call himself the Christ most of the time. He does call himself the Christ sometimes. But most of the time, he calls himself the son of man. Uh, and that's just, you know, you can count it out. That's, that's just true. So Jesus is the son of man in this scenario. And if he's the son of man, if Jesus is the human one, then who's Caiaphas? You see, Caiaphas is the beast. Caiaphas gets that, by the way. Caiaphas understands what Jesus is saying. And that's why he gets so upset. So what is Jesus saying in Matthew 26, 64? He's saying that Jerusalem... Israel as a whole is a beast because they stood against God. And ultimately what he's saying is they're going to be destroyed because all the beasts that you see in Scripture, all the nations that are described as beasts are ultimately destroyed. So what's the lesson for us in this? Well, if you read carefully through Scripture, you'll notice that most nations, especially all of the big nations, the nations who play a big role in the story of the Bible, most of those nations at some point or another are called beasts in scripture. And the lesson for us in this is that all nations that are built by man, all nations are beasts. And that does not mean that a nation can't do good things. There are plenty of nations that do good things. Jerusalem did great things for a little while. But eventually Jerusalem stood against God. And Jerusalem was called a beast. So all nations are beasts. Canada is a beast. Great Britain is a beast. Mexico is a beast. But America as well. America is a beast as well in God's eye. And someone says, no, of course, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. All nations built by men are beasts. And look, we know this. America has done a lot of good things. America has done a lot of good things in the world, but America is not perfect. And that's not surprising to anyone. We live in a country where some people, they, they sacrifice children on the altar of comfort. And you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about abortion. You guys know what I'm talking about. America's not perfect. We live in a country where some people, greedy people, put profits over people. See, we live in a country that has aligned itself against God. So how does God see America? America and all nations that are built by men are beasts to God. There's only one nation that is not a beast, and that is the nation that Christ has made. Well, what does that mean for us? What are some things that we should take home with this lesson in mind? Well, first of all, America is not God's nation. We are. Now, we hear people talk about, oh, America's God's nation. No, it's not. We are God's nation. And it's, it's sad. There are Christians who want the government to do all of the work. There are Christians who want the government to bear all fruit so that they don't have to. Well, America is not God's nation. America it should not be primarily the one bearing fruit for God. We should be. Let me give you an example of this. There are people, there are people who, who never teach their children how to pray. 
There are men who never teach their children how to pray at home, but they'll, they'll scream about how the government should teach children to pray in schools. Look, I think that'd be a good thing. But it's not the government's job to teach our kids how to pray. It's our job. See, America is not God's nation. We are. It's not the government's job to teach us how to be Christian. It's our job to live as, to live as Christians. Another lesson. Our hope is in, or excuse me, our primary allegiance is, in the king, is to the kingdom. Our primary allegiance is to the kingdom. You know, it's sad to see how much politics has invaded the church. Seems like people are more aligned to, the, to, to political party than to kingdom. You know, it's sad to see on Facebook there are people who will divide the kingdom for the beast. The reason I say this is, you know, election's coming up. And that's a tough time for a lot of congregations. People are so loyal to whatever, to whatever group that they're in. But we need to remember that our primary, our primary allegiance is not to some group here. Our primary allegiance is to the kingdom. And by the way, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. I'm not saying it. You know, you can't say Pledge of Allegiance. You could say Pledge of Allegiance. The point is, our primary allegiance is to the kingdom. One final lesson that we can take home. Our hope is in kingdom, not country. Daniel 7 makes it clear that all nations that are built by men will eventually come to an end. But there is a nation that will stand, and that is God's nation. God's nation is the only nation that will stand, and it will, and, and, and it will not be defeated by any other nation. And I feel like sometimes we forget this. I, I heard a Christian once say, a very strong Christian, by the way, uh, he said this, and I think it was on Facebook. He, he put something like this on Facebook, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, uh, if they win the election, and I'm not going to say who the they are. He says, if they win the election, our lifestyle is going to come to an end. And I read that, and I said, man, what lifestyle are you talking about? It doesn't matter who wins the White House. Our lifestyle will never come to an end. You know, it seems to me that his hope is in something else completely. His hope is in, is in country, but our hope needs to be in kingdom, not country. We've got to remember that our lifestyle, it doesn't matter who's in the White House, who's in charge, our lifestyle will never come to an end because this kingdom is going to win. The beast will not win. This kingdom is going to win. And that's something that we need to remember every day. So I guess, in conclusion, this kingdom is going to ruin. Let's remember that. But let me ask, whose side are you on? You know, the story of the Bible, the story of the Bible could be simplified into a story of conflict. I think I've said that before. I, I use the example of two cities. But the story of the Bible could be thought of as conflict between man and beast, those who are with God and those who are against God, those who are part of the, the seed of the woman versus those who are the, the seed of the serpent, the seed of the beast. Let me ask, which side are you on? Maybe there's someone here this morning who realizes they've been siding with the beast. They're on the wrong side, but you want to, I guess, in a symbolic way, become human again. You want to come back to the kingdom, the truly human kingdom. That's ironic, but you know, that's how it is. The truly human kingdom. Maybe there's someone who wants to come back to that kingdom. Well, we love to have you. Or maybe there's someone who wants to Become a child of God through baptism. Through baptism where we're buried with Christ and raised to walk in what? In newness of life. Because we've put off the old man, which some might say is like a beast, and we've put on a new man who is being renewed into the image of Christ. Maybe there's someone who wants to, to make that, that pledge of allegiance to Jesus. Well, we'd love to have you. If you need to respond to the invitation, you can come now as we stand and as we